This week on the West Walk, one-on-one -on -one with Chief of the Defense Staff, General Wayne Ayer. We have to take a 360 degree view of the, uh, of the threat. From modernizing NORAD to sending military aid to Ukraine, are the Canadian forces ready to take on aggressive and sophisticated adversaries? And addressing the danger from within, sexual misconduct. The CAF is currently sitting on hundreds of recommendations. In the wake of the Arbour report, we'll ask Canada's top general what he's doing to change the military and the Conservative Party at a crossroads. I'm running for Prime Minister to put you back in control of your life by making Canada the freest nation on earth, by removing the gatekeepers. Pierre Polyev's populist message is attracting new members to the party, but is it alienating moderate Conservative voters? An exclusive interview with Conservative Party veteran and former Senator Marjorie LeBreton, who breaks her silence on concerns about the party's future. It's Sunday, June 26th, and this is the West Block. Hello, thanks for joining us today. I'm Mercedes Stevenson. NATO leaders, including Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, are meeting in Madrid this week. The summit comes as the Canadian military faces increasing pressure to do more to address an ever-expanding list of global security threats. From war in Ukraine... We are fighting for our future, for our freedom... ...to increasing Chinese aggression frequently zooming past the planes a mere 20 to 100 feet away. China's actions are irresponsible and provocative. As a PRC adopts a more coercive and aggressive approach to its territorial claims. And a sexual misconduct scandal amongst the military's highest ranks that continues to reverberate and has shaken the troops and the public's trust. I just hope that these recommendations don't end up a little box on the chart of the many that are still being studied. The Canadian Armed Forces are facing unprecedented challenges in a dangerous world. One that is demanding more of those who serve, not just to fight wars, but help in pandemics and deal with climate change induced disasters, all on a limited budget. To talk about all of this, I'm joined by the Chief of the Defence Staff, General Wayne Eyre. Thank you for joining us today, General Eyre. Nice well, to see you. Well, thanks for having me, Mercedes. You have an extremely busy and important job at a time in global history like we've not seen in many, many years in terms of the threats that we were just talking about in that opening package. What, in your view, is the state of the world in terms of security and Canada's national security? Well, Mercedes, I think history is going to look upon this period as uh, perhaps a turning point in the, uh, in the global order, because the rules-based international order under which we have thrived for generations is as fragile is, as it has ever been. And I think for the rest of our lives, we're going to see an order that is, is characterized by confrontation. Confrontation between, on one side, the authoritarian states in the world, and the others, the, um, the liberal democracies. And, and so that threat is real. You know, over the course of the last number of weeks, I've, uh, I've traveled uh, and have had numerous conversations with my, uh, my counterparts, chiefs of defense in, in our closest allies in Europe, um, in Asia Pacific, and they are all very concerned. The threat of uh, global conflict, of great power conflict, is as, is as great as it has been in decades. Uh, so it, uh, we, we need to be worried. I think that if you're worried, most Canadians are worried hearing that. And it's no secret the Canadian Armed Forces needs money, you need people, you're struggling to recruit. Are you capable of dealing with these kinds of threats that aren't going away? So the Canadian Armed Forces is our nation's insurance policy, our ultimate insurance policy, if you want to put it that way. And so we've got to pay the premiums on, on that insurance policy. We've got to make sure that we have the readiness uh, to be able to, uh, to react to these crises at home and, and internationally. And we've got to make sure we've got the people to be able to do that. So people, capabilities, training and sustainment are necessary for that readiness. But do you have that? Do we have that? Well, it depends on the scale. Um, yeah, we can respond, um, but with how much and for how long and with what capabilities. Um, you know, there's no military commander in history who's had all the capabilities that they've wanted, but there are some that we, we need uh, to be able to, to respond adequately uh, in, this, uh, in this world. We've got to make sure our training is up to, uh, up to strength. We need to make sure, or up to, uh, 
up to requirements. We've got to make sure our personnel strength is where it needs to be. The capabilities that we need to be able to prosecute a, uh, or be able to uh, engage in a 21st century conflict. Um, one where technology is rapidly uh, advancing. We've got to make sure that we have, have those capabilities as well. But it sounds to me like you have concerns about whether you have enough people, enough training, enough capabilities. Oh, I have, I have big concerns in, in many uh, different areas, you know, ranging from people to capabilities to, uh, to readiness. And so it's a delicate balance every day as we, as we take a look at today's operational output, as we take a look at where we need to invest uh, uh, people to modernize, uh, to change policies, to, um, uh, to deliver on, uh, on capabilities. So it's a balancing act. Right now, we are going through what, uh, what we call reconstitution. A reconstitution is a military term for rebuilding after an operation. The operation that we're talking about is the pandemic, uh, which has not been kind to the Canadian forces as our operational tempo has increased and our numbers have decreased. So we've got to rebuild, rebuild our numbers, but at the same time, build for that future with the capabilities, the force structure and the, uh, the competencies that are necessary. You've been sending a lot of material to Ukraine, including material that you've had to essentially borrow from the Americans because we didn't have it. What effect is the government support for Ukraine having on Canadian war stocks and our ability to prosecute a war if we had to? So we have taken a look at what's in our inventory. We've donated some of that. We've purchased uh, some from allies. We've purchased some from, um, uh, from industry. Uh, I'm worried about our, our, our stocks of such commodities as ammunition. And, and so it's a delicate balancing act of what we donate today, uh, what we save for future contingencies, and what we can, we, what we can get from, uh, from industry. You know, when we look at what we donate, uh, we've got to be careful about just donating a piece of equipment. We've got to look at it as a capability set. Artillery is one example. So if we just donate a gun, um, without the accompanying ammunition training spare parts, it's just a hunk of metal. And, and so investing in spare parts, investing in ammunition, and we've just announced uh, you know, 20,000 plus rounds of 155 ammunition. But training, training is the one thing where Canada has, has really created a strategic effect. As we speak, uh, we are training Ukrainian soldiers on um, Canadian, American, Australian, M777 systems in a third location. We've trained hundreds of uh, Ukrainian soldiers on this artillery system. That is value added. You mentioned money, and obviously defense chiefs always want more, but it's been a long time since you had an injection. We were both at an announcement last week on Monday about $4.9 billion going to NORAD. You talked about the threats like cruise missiles and hypersonic missiles, which we've seen used in Ukraine, mm -hmm. able to defeat our defensive systems, very different than the nuclear world that NORAD was built for. I've heard from a number of defense sources that that $4.9 billion is actually being reprofiled from within the department and is not new money. Do you know if that's true? So I haven't completely figured out myself this, the source of funds uh, for this, so I can't, I can't say definitiv definitively where it's coming from. You know, I will say, though, the, the announcement was welcome. Um, but in terms of continental defense, you know, defending this continent, um, what we looked at with NORAD modernization, that is just the air domain. So as part of our defense policy update, we've got to look at the other domains. We've got to look at space, we've got to look at cyber, uh, maritime, both uh, surface and especially subsurface with the submarine threat. And we've got to look at land uh, so that we can, we, can, can, we can create a persistent presence in the extremities of our country, so more infrastructure in, in, in the far north. Is, is your department right now, though, having to look at the possibility of cutting certain programs to redirect that $4.9 billion to NORAD? Because my understanding is there's meetings at National Defense as we speak about that. And, and real concern, this money is not new. So we haven't looked at, uh, at cutting. Um, but we, as always, we have to look at, uh, at rebalancing. And the force that we have today is not the force that we need to, for tomorrow. So we need to look at force structure. Uh, do we have it in the right place? Do we need to look at re-rolling of units? Um, so that uh, they undertake roles that are uh, more relevant for the future security environment. That is, is all important. I, I think, obviously, lots more to come on that NORAD money, and a lot of concerns if we don't know where it's coming from, because it's a huge price tag if it's not a new injection of funds, and the military clearly needs more money to keep doing all the things that you're being asked to do. 
Sexual misconduct, also clearly a huge issue for you. You talked about recruiting. My understanding is the most recent numbers show that only 4% of new recruits are women. Uh, the sexual misconduct scandal continues to reverberate. There continue to be senior officers charged. Uh, one retired, well, actually both retired now, charged with sexual assault dating back to RMC. Lots of questions about what you're going to do to change the culture. When we last spoke about this, I asked you what your position was on RMC. Since then, a number of grads posted their pictures saying they were proud RMC grads and indicating they didn't believe change was necessary. What are your thoughts on that? So we've got to embrace the recommendation that Madame Arbor had in her, uh, her report, and we have to have a dispassionate look at is the institution fit for purpose for the 21st century and, and producing what is, is needed. You know, many are, are proud of the, the post-secondary institution that they came from, um, but we have to have an open mind as we go forward and, uh, and have that, uh, that, that um, look without emotion as to what is best for Canada, what is best for the Canadian Armed Forces uh, to produce the leaders we need for the future. Uh, Trevor Kadju was a star military performer expected to be the next commander of the Army. He has now been charged with sexual assault dating back to his time at RMCs, one of those officers we were talking about. There's been a lot of senior officers still in uniform defending him publicly, in some cases saying that people shouldn't be called a victim by the media until it's been through the courts. And I've had a number of sexual misconduct victims and survivors reach out to me and say, how are we supposed to come forward if this is still the environment? Nothing is changing. So as we go forward, we got to continue to learn from every, every new case and realize that our actions, actions of individuals can have impact way beyond what was, uh, what was intended, and especially on social media as we learn to operate in this, uh, this new environment. Um, you know, I will tell you that the, the restorative engagement program that we have undertaken, I think is going to be a, um, a game changer in terms of understanding at the emotional level uh, the, the impact of this. And the feedback that I've had from the defense cohort, uh, the initial tranche of, uh, of individuals and members who've gone through this have told me that it's, it's some of the most profound um, experience in terms of understanding what others have gone through that they've had. So we're going to continue to learn. Are there going to be missteps along the way? Absolutely. This is a human organization um, and we need to learn and continue to learn and continue to develop and continue to make this institution better. When General Kadja was uh, scheduled to become the Army commander, it was in the fall. I've seen an email suggesting that you knew about allegations against him as early as July. Is that true? No. So when I was uh, informed of allegations on the 5th of September, took immediate action and, uh, and, and did not put him in charge of the Army at that point. So you weren't aware of any kind of concern about a previous relationship prior to that? No allegations were, were raised to me. Now, given that this case is in front of the courts, uh, we, shouldn't pr we should probably not uh, discuss it in any more detail. Uh, one last question to you. China, obviously a big concern, buzzing Canadian jets. You've been talking to your counterparts. How significant is that threat and what do you think the Chinese are trying to achieve by doing this? So we've seen an increased um, number of unsafe unprofessional interactions over the course of the last number of deployments we've had. Um, and our allies have, have seen the same thing. Um, and so the sense is that they want to deter us, dissuade us from operating in that part of the world. You know, as we uphold the rules-based international order, we've got to call out threats against it um, where we see it. Because freedom of navigation, especially in well, freedom of navigation, freedom of operation in international airspace, international waters has got to be respected. I just met with the, uh, the Japanese ambassador several hours ago and we discussed this. Uh, and I met with the Japanese defense minister and the Japanese uh, chief of defense um, last two weeks ago. And they are very, very welcome, welcoming of our presence in that, uh, that area. And so we've got to continue to work responsibly, engage responsibly with our allies in, in that part of the world. Um, you know, so much of the, the future of the world in terms of uh, economic growth is based in that part of the world. Canada is a Pacific country, and so we should be there. General Ayer, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your time. Oh, thank you. Up next, a high-profile conservative speaks out with her concerns about the direction of the party. From convoy support to populism, former Senator Marjorie LeBreton joins us with her views after the break.
Conservative Party of Canada seems to be searching for its identity, torn between Tory traditionalism and populist forces. Support for the convoy that paralyzed downtown Ottawa in February has been a breakpoint for many, with leadership frontrunner Pierre Polyev endorsing the demonstrators, while other Conservatives have expressed concern about supporting a breach of a traditional Conservative value, law and order. Concerns about where the party is going after some Conservative MPs hosted key members of the convoy on Parliament Hill last week week are a topic of hot debate inside the party right now. Joining us to talk about all this is a former confident to Prime Minister, confidant, pardon me, to Prime Minister Stephen Harper and, of course, former government leader in the Senate, Marjorie LeBreton. Thank you so much for joining well, it's us. It's my pleasure to be here. Yep. It's nice to see you. Nice to see you, too, in person <laughs> after many years, yeah, it seems, in the been pandemic. a few years since I've done this. And, you know, when I last talked to you, it felt like what the Conservative Party was was a pretty solid thing. You could yes. wrap your arms around it. You knew what it meant. Now there's a lot of questions. I had to wonder what you were thinking when you saw Conservative MPs hosting key members of the convoy on Parliament Hill this week. What are your thoughts well, on that? Well, I'm a traditional Conservative, and um, uh, one of the cornerstones, the main cornerstones of Conservatism is law and order. And law and order is law and order. And illegal blockades are illegal blockades, whether they're at at a border crossing, a pipeline, a railway, uh, a railway line, they're illegal, and and uh, and they sh and the full force of the law should be brought in to deal with them. And you can't you can't have you can't have um, you know block the city of Ottawa and say that say that's okay, but um, but it's not okay for some other group to block a railroad. So I was just. The, the whole the whole idea of, of wrecking a, a cornerstone of conservatism in law and order was sort of really really upsets me, and I'm very very worried, uh, Mercedes, about um, what's happening to the party and what's happening during this leadership debate. What do you think the risk is for the party here if well, it continues in this direction? You know, I I said yesterday to a friend. I really fear that the great accommodation that was reached between Stephen Harper and Peter McKay in the uh, in the fall of 2003 is is fracturing beyond repair, and and we have this leadership debate going on. The party greenlit six candidates, um, um, and they all they all they're bringing their own ideas to the table, but. The idea of, of uh, you know, accusing people of, of um, uh, lying and, and crooks, and I mean, th this, this is not the debate we should be having. We should be having a debate uh, about who we are, what we stand for, and what we would do if we were to form a government, because Canadians are not adverse to voting for Conservatives. You know, eight of the ten provinces have Conservative governments or Conservative-leading governments. So what? So rather than have this vicious, um, um, grievance-driven, uh, fuel-on-the-fire debate we're having right now, is just to me, I hate to say it, but I'm afraid that the Conservative Party that I've been um, a member of all my life is, um, is completely foreign to me. Do you feel like you you no longer have a home in the party? Well, or it could I actually come to that? I actually feel that way. If 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 we don't if if we don't get it right this time, we've had three leadership debates now in the last six and a half years. If we don't get it right this time, and 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 the and the, and the members of our party, and it would be nice if the party would give the membership list to the candidates. If if they um, if they could have a proper debate, respectful. Um, and, and respect each other and put ideas on the table about what we would do if we reformed the government. F forget about blaming this person or that person, throwing fuel on the fire, and, and talk about the issues. And of course, I'm involved with an organization now called Center Ice Conservatives because we're trying to get people to talk about issues about uh, where people live and, and issues people care about. And, you know, we've got this debate on the extreme left and on the extreme right, and all of the people like myself in the moderate mainstream middle, center, center right conservatives, like the, the oxygen has been sucked out of the air. And so we're trying in center right, uh, center right conservatives is to actually um, foster debate amongst the candidates. Now, some of the candidates are trying, uh, but uh, as long as you have uh, the scorched earth policy, 
jumping on the grievance brigade. Uh, we're never, you know, it's a great disservice to the party, but worse, it's a terrible disservice to the country because the country needs a viable political choice. Right now we have an incompetent government who are sort of scatter, scatterbrain approach to everything. Um, they're ethically challenged and, and it's, people want an alternative. We have to be electable. We have to win an election in order for any of the issues that we care about to be addressed. So when you mark your ballot, you have to, you have to factor in who you think is the best person that's electable in the whole country. I have to ask you about Pierre Polyev. Yeah. I, I know you've known Pierre since yeah. he was I a young man. On, uh, yeah. You've worked very Fort closely with him. Yeah. You live in his riding, I yeah. believe. I worked in the last campaign volunteering, answering the phone in, his, in the campaign office. Uh, I hear you've resigned off of his board of directors. Yeah. Yes, I do. Why is that? Uh, well, it was again over over the uh, over the convoy, because I felt I felt that uh, I, you know lo the law is the law, uh, illegal blockades are illegal blockades, and I felt that uh, he and others in the party uh, actually um, they if, if if they'd have it was going it was going to the, you could easily tell this was not going to end well. And, and actually, the blame for all of this should be at the feet of the prime minister. But when we, uh, when we have people who uh, send signals that somehow or other they'll support one kind of a, one kind of, um, a protest or a, I call it an illegal blockade because that's what it was and is. Um, and uh, so I, I uh, yes, that's true. I'm no longer a member of the board, but I've moved on was, from there. Was that hard for you to do to, for someone you've known so hard, well? Extremely hard. I mean, I you know, and I've got good friends, and and so as a result, uh, I actually have not uh, got involved in anyone's campaign. I, I did, I did early on try to, um, I was part of an advisory group to get Tasha Carradine into the, into the race. She would have been an outstanding candidate. But then when she decided not to get into the race, I decided to spend my time with Santa Rice Conservatives and try and, and influence the debate from that point of view. Well, we appreciate you coming on. I know it's it's not an easy thing to no, talk about isn't. a party that I'm, you've I'm, dedicated your I'm life to very, like this. I'm very very worried about about the. Uh, well, I'm very worried for our party, but I'm very worried for the country as well because we are in big trouble in this country. Marjorie LeBreton, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Up next, as the House breaks for the summer, final thoughts on some of the major stories that dominated the political landscape. The House of Commons wrapped up its spring session last week. MPs won't return until September, where it will be another hybrid sitting of Parliament. One more reminder of pandemic politics persisting. It's been quite a year so far, from the convoy demonstrations to war in Ukraine, inflation, gun control and travel woes. And now budding questions about possible interference in the RCMP Mass Casualty Commission. The politics never stop, but our show will be taking a brief break for the summer. Thank you to our crew for all of their hard work this year and to you for joining us each Sunday. We'll see you back here in September for the West Walk. I'm Mercedes Stevenson. Have a great summer.